So this is Jerry. Say hi, Jerry. Hi, Jerry. This is Jerry's book. That's the title, by the way. It's like you pick up the book and it says this is Jerry's book. Thank you. Now, I have a question. How, based off of only this information, how did we go from Jerry to Jerry's book? Jerry wrote it. Anybody else? He owns the book. They have the same name. Jerry used a dragon. Okay, no wrong answers. Okay. Okay, that's also a possibility. Let's let's go with my suggestion. Okay, maybe Jerry wrote it. Maybe he sat here at this typewriter and typed out Jerry's book. Okay. Oh, you can't see the graphic. Oh no. Okay, that's fine. Um, maybe he wrote it out. That's a normal assumption, right? If someone says this is my book. It came from me. You would think they sat at a desk and wrote it out. Now, suppose that we're reading Jerry's book, and suddenly we come to page 36, and we get this really weird, convoluted story. And it turns out that Jerry's book, it's about Jerry, but it starts with Jerry's career that started 20 years before Jerry's book was even written. Okay? So he starts his, his career, and he's going around sharing stories, giving speeches, Maybe he's writing some you know, poems or jokes or what have you. And after 20 years, he's like, you know what? I'm going to start writing this into a book. Okay? But instead of sitting down at a typewriter, he hires his friend, Barry. And he says, Barry, I want you to write all this. You know me really well. We're best buds. You know our history. You know my best bits. You know where I come from. I want you to write down this 20-year history uh, of me and uh, include that in there. And mind you, all of this is being told on page 36 of Jerry's book. So you're like reading this in Jerry's book, okay? But the story continues that through a mishap, oh, so they make version one of Jerry's book. But through a mishap, that copy gets destroyed in a fire. Whoops. <laughs> Whoops. Jerry's book has now gone up in flames, literally. So Jerry says, well, that wasn't very good, so let's do that again. And so he goes to Barry, and he says, all right, Barry, we got to make another version. we got to rewrite this. This is an awesome book. It's a shame it got burned up. And that's what they do. They write book version number two. But Jerry says, you know what? I wasn't really feeling version one. Why don't you make some edits, make it a little spicy? And so it says in there that Barry added some similar words as the original, made some edits, made some updates. doesn't specify, just says that he made some updates. Now, here's the thing. That's version one. That's version two. And this is on page 36 of Jerry's book. But this is all in Jerry's book. So how many other things have happened to lead to the version that we're actually reading? It's complicated, right? It's not, it's, and it's not clear. All we have to go on originally was this is Jerry's book. Now, page 36 has this weird convoluted story, and it only talks about the first two versions. But if it's talking about this book, then you know that it can't be identical to this book, right? Bertrand Russell can help us with that, right? So there, there's a problem here. But the point is, the main thrust of all this is that when we revisit our original assumption that Jerry sat down at a typewriter to type it all out, this assumption is radically oversimplified, and it's enormously complicated what actually happened, right? So maybe what we need to do is if, when we come to this question, okay, this is Jerry's book, it came from Jerry, is think, what are we assuming about the relationship between Jerry and Jerry's book? Now you may think, okay, that's well and good, but this is not a Seinfeld fan club, all right? This is a Bible club or whatever. What does this have to do with anything, okay? Well, but first, do y'all y'all track, track with the story? We still at level one? Okay, good. I'm living up to that promise. You stole that story. Well, here's what it has to do with the Bible. This is Jerry, the prophet Jeremiah. And this is the book of Jerry, called the book of Jeremiah. Now, I have a question. How do you think Jerry, the book of Jerry came from Jerry? Well, if we were to revisit our original assumption, maybe he sat down with papyrus and a quill and wrote it out, right? But as I have successfully primed you, you know it's more complicated than that. Well, in chapter 36 of the book of Jeremiah, 
we have this detour that talks about the composition of the book of Jeremiah. Now, mind you, you've been reading it for 36 chapters, and now suddenly in the middle, it's going to tell you how this book was put together. And it turns out that, yeah, God commissioned Jeremiah to preach his word, and then 20 years later said, write this down in a scroll and deliver your message to uh, the king, the king Jehoiakim. And Jeremiah, rather than sitting down and writing it out himself, hires the scribe Baruch. And Baruch, and with collaborating with Jeremiah, produced scroll number one, and they deliver that to the king Jehoiakim. And it essentially says, house of Judah, turn from your evil ways. And king Jehoiakim says, I don't like this, and he throws it into a fire. And so God comes back to Jeremiah and says, that's some bad bull. Don't deal with that. We're going to try this again. Write another scroll with the same content as before. And so he goes to Baruch, and they make scroll number two. And specifically, it says in chapter 36 that Baruch added many similar words. Sidebar, there's a translation area. It just says that they added many similar words. Unclear if it was Jeremiah, Baruch, or both of them, but some translations specifically specify Baruch. But the point is that this scroll was given editorial oversight by Baruch. And now, as you recall from our previous example, all of this is being read on a scroll that describes this incident as being in the past and as other things happening after it, and after that second scroll being delivered. So we don't get any details about the composition of the scroll after this little episode. Right? So here's a picture from the Bible Project that puts it, another way of putting it, you have Jeremiah going around, he has sermons, poems, essays, injunctions, prophecies, and whatnot. There are stories about Jeremiah, where he grew up, stuff that he did, and Baruch is weaving all of these things together into what we have, which is the book of Jeremiah today. So now, here's the question. Is Jeremiah the author? Open discussion. What do you think? Is it right to say that Jeremiah is the author of the book of Jeremiah? Yeah. Okay. You were going to say, you don't have to raise your hand. You can just speak up, but go ahead. From my perspective, it's like chicken piece here. Uh-huh. Like so it's like you're maybe reading the same book as the original was. Mm-hmm. So I'd say it's just for, for interpretation. Yeah, it's I hard to say. He's not Baruch in this sense. It's not Baruch, or it's not Jeremiah, it's Baruch. Mm-hmm. Anybody else? Go ahead. Okay, so neither would be the author. <laughs> Isn't God's the author? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I, I see what you're saying. Right. So specifically, so if you read the whole chapter, all of all of chapter 36, which tells this whole story, it says that this there's a scroll that has all of Jeremiah's teachings, or 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 a subsection. We don't know exactly. It's delivered to the king, and that particular piece of parchment is set on fire. So that's gone. We don't have that. And then God says, write another one. Um, and the text says specifically, Baruch and Jeremiah made a second scroll and added many similar words to it and then delivered that to King Jehoiakim. And I don't, I don't remember what, what happened to that one. But, but the point is that whatever those scrolls had is contained in the book of Jeremiah as we have it today. And so when we're talking about the book of Jeremiah, I'm talking about not those individual scrolls, but the, the book that we have in the Bible today, the book you're reading right now, right? I assume, I, I assume that's okay. Yeah. Okay, so here's the thesis, okay? Authorship is complicated, right? We could say that he's the author. We could say Baruch is the author. We could say neither are the author, both are the author, God is the author. Like, it's weird. It's complicated, right? So, 
what I'm going to do now on your handout is, and I do apologize, but thank you for indulging me with my cold open here, is we're going to talk about nine different meanings of the word author. This is on the front here. And my purpose here is you're probably thinking, good Lord, nine, do I have to keep track of all these? No, you don't. The purpose is just to illustrate how diverse the concept is um, and to know that there's like a lot of different terms for it, okay? So I'm going to explain what they are, but you don't have to like remember each one. So the first one we have is uh, inscription, which is so-and-so is the author because so-and-so wrote it on the piece of paper, okay? Or typed it or what have you. The second is dictation. So-and-so is the author because he dictated word for word to the man what put it on the piece of paper, right? So Jeremiah would dictate to Baruch stuff that happens, Baruch writes it down. Third would be collaboration. Two people, more people collaborated to produce this document. So you have co-authors, okay? Fourth would be delegation, where say a prophet delegates one of his scribes to write and say, or say, I want you to write a letter to this people group from me. Fifth would be compilation. So this would be after the author is dead or maybe his disciples or something like that. Uh, take some of his writings, some of his works, and compile them together into an edited volume. Okay? And then they might add some other stuff uh, about, say, the historical context or something like that. The uh, sixth one is a school of thought. So you have teachers who are philosophers or what have you, and they have disciples. Um, so Plato would be an example. And after they, uh, and, and their disciples start writing various philosophical treatises, and they write them and ascribe their teacher's name because this is the Platonic school of thought. So they put Plato on there. Or this is, you know, Jeremiah's disciples. So they put Jeremiah on there, something like that. Seventh, we have what if, which is kind of an extension of this. And this is where uh, a disciple of a teacher would write as if his dead teacher were alive today and say, hmm, I wonder what he would say to this particular circumstance. So he picks up a pen and imagines what he would say and writes it out and attributes it to him in that sense. Penultimately, we have labeling, and this is where we have some work that never had a name on it, but later on down the line, a label is attached to it for any of these reasons. Maybe it's a school of thought, maybe it was later identified, maybe it was associated with the tradition, who was it? And then finally, we have forgery. Ooh, he's bad, that's why he's red. And forgery is when somebody picks up a pen and intentionally deceives the audience by saying, I am so-and-so. And the purpose is to pretend to be that author with the purpose of deceiving the audience that they are that author, okay? So these are nine models. There are obviously more, but these are just nine that I think are good. Um, any comments or questions about this general thing? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I typed it out in Twitter, and I put my name on it, or my mom's name. Well, sure. Some name who I thought it sounded like, but Maya Angelou, and I published it. That seems kind of like sus. Yeah, it could be, <coughs> depending. Um, but this would, yeah, I, I, I would have to go into examples. But this would be things like, um, uh, for example, Pseudo Dionysius is brought up a lot. And he's identified because it's like, well, these documents were associated with Dionysius, but it's not Dionysius, so we call him pseudo-Dionysius, and it's just sort of like we use that in parlance, but we're not seriously ascribing it to him. So that would be like a more conventional way. Sometimes they're labeled after the fact because it was, in fact, discovered to be written by that person. Um, this was the case for people to use pseudonyms, like Mark Twain, Samuel Clements, and um, Lewis Carroll as well. They use pseudonyms. So in life, they use pseudonyms, but then later on, scholars of their work said, oh, um, actually, this work that was written under a, a radically different pseudonym, it, it was actually Samuel Clements, or it actually was Lewis Carroll. Yes? Do you know what blackout poems are? Blackout poems? Yeah. No. Like when you type it up, they have like something typed out or written out, and you just like cross out all the words that correspond to like something. To change the meaning of it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, 
I'm not really sure what that would be, what that would be, but yeah, yeah. Okay. Any other comments or questions about these? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, so the, the main difference is uh, if the teacher is still alive. So like a school of thought, you might have a student of Plato write a treatise, and it's attributed to Plato, and like he signs off on it, so to speak. I was, I, I'm, I'm keeping a lot of these modern examples out, but yes. Uh, I can talk a lot of examples of, of like contemporary scholarship and authorship disputes and things like that that we could get into, but yeah. But what if this would be uh, the teacher's dead, or he's, he's not, he can't do anything, and so this is just purely hypothetical um, writing an extension of that. Okay, great questions. All right, now, you may be thinking, okay, this is fun. This is cool trivia. Why do we care about this? All right, well, the reason is that a lot of people tend to think of debates about authorship like this. You have these are the works that are inscribed by the author, and everything outside of that is a forgery. And as we can see, that's already an oversimplified model. A better approach would be something kind of like this, where we have a centered set of the author's influence, and then it slowly kind of tails off the further you get away from the, the author. And then out here you have forgery, right? Um, and so if we were to look at those models, we could say that in the very center of that set would be inscription. There's no way an author could influence a text more other than being the man what wrote it down physically. Uh, slightly outside of that, you would have dictation, where he's dictating it to somebody else, but that person may uh, edit um, or restate or rephrase things. Collaboration, active involvement, but uh, not sole influence of one author. Delegation would also kind of fit in this uh, general area. Uh, and then compilation would be there as well, because this is using the original works of the author and just putting them together in a, in a collection. Then, so that's, that's how I categorize these five. So you have inscription is at the very center. These four are sort of the, the next ones out. And then the furthest ones out would be like the school of thought, the what if, uh, or the labeling. So to go back to Katie's point earlier, uh, some people would say, ah, this doesn't count. But clearly, there's enough influence of the author that the, the label gets attached to it. But we can start to see that these are, it's, there's a gradation, right, where these are definitely not as influenced by the author um, as these others are. But at the same time, they're not exactly deceptive forgeries. Okay, make sense? So, I'm gonna go back to our original example. So this is Jerry, this is the Book of Jerry. We know that this is part of how the Book of Jerry was composed. So now in light of that, now how can we say that Jerry is the author in light of our eight models. What do you think? Collaborate. Collaborate. Okay, we have a vote for number three. Dictation. Dictation. Anybody else? Yes. <laughs> Compilation over here. What, did you, what were you going to say, Audrey? Yeah. Oh, this one too? So a vote for, for these here? Yeah, that's kind of what um, I thought. Yeah, all four of these are kind of in motion. So now, not only is it complicated in the sense that there are nine options, but they're not mutually exclusive. We have all four of these in play, and that's just by what we know about, right? Because we know he dictated to Baruch. We know Baruch collaborated. We know that he delegated Baruch to do some stuff, and we know that Baruch compiled stuff. That, and that's just what we know. Yes? So, yeah. Well, that's, um, I'd have to get into the details. But to give you an example, the Book of Lamentations uh, has traditionally been associated with Jeremiah because of that reason. Because it fits with his themes. It was composed about the same time. There are a lot of similarities to it. Um, and so some people would, would ascribe that to Jeremiah, even though it doesn't claim to be from Jeremiah. Yes, Dave. What about when it got translated into English? Yes, that's a good question. Um, but it's not going to alter the authorship question. Yeah, but yeah, the translations are important. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so chapter 36 is summarizing like the previous uh, 20 years of Jeremiah's um, ministry. And Jeremiah 1 starts off with uh, the Lord God commissioned Jeremiah, before I knew you in the womb, I formed you, et cetera, and all that kind of stuff, right? So it's a lot more complicated still, but yeah. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts about those? Okay. So now with all that prolegomena out of the way, let's talk about the actual topic, right? So our theme is, our theme this semester has been confronting critical challenges uh, to the Bible. Um, and we've been doing that uh, featuring uh, this book that I didn't bring with me. Okay. A book um, that goes through various critical challenges. It's called Evangelical Faith and the Challenge of Historical Criticism. It's on the back of its citation one. And something that I noticed, so originally I was going to do just chapter four of this book, but I realized is that the question we're talking about tonight permeates about three chapters in the book, which is a three out of the nine subjects. So this is like a really high level question. Uh, and the general challenge looks something kind of like this. So this is Bart the critic. He's a critical scholar of the New Testament. And this is Carol the Christian, our standing Christian. And Bart uh, will say something to the effect of, you think that this person wrote this Bible book, but real facts, he didn't. Oh, no, this is scary, right? Scary thought. What do we do? What do we do? Um, and basically, three of those chapters take this form. One of them's with Mosaic authorship, one's with Paul, one's with um, Daniel, whatever. But they all take kind of this form, okay? But sometimes these specific author challenges don't really matter. So suppose that Bart says, hey, you think that Jeremiah wrote Jeremiah, but it was actually Baruch. <laughs> Do you care? No, this, this one's, yeah, this is a silly, this is a silly objection. Nobody's going to care about that, right? But suppose that Bart comes along and says, as Bart actually does, that Paul didn't write Ephesians. Okay? That seems to be a bit more of, serious, right? A bit more serious. If Paul's not associated with Ephesians, that might be a problem. But what if Bart says, you think that Solomon wrote Song of Solomon, but he didn't? We don't read it anyway. <laughs> not after last week. After last week, we read it. Okay? I just care that book. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's not clear. How many of you have even know anything about, have ever thought about the authorship of Song of Solomon? Uh, before last week. <laughs> okay, all right, good point, yes. Yeah, but it seems like, hmm, I really don't know if I should care about this. Or what if, what if Bart says something like, Jeremiah didn't write Lamentations? Should I really care about this? That's what I want to focus on tonight. I want to answer the question, why should I care? Because sometimes you should, and sometimes you shouldn't, okay? And so here is our metaphor we use, triage. This comes from the medical world. Triage is the procedure by which, uh, for example, like ER medics decide who gets treatment. They decide which uh, medical condition is more serious than another. If someone walks into the ER with a uh, bee sting, not a big deal. If someone walks into the ER with a beehive that they stepped in, much bigger deal, right? So that's what we're trying to do. So if someone says, Jeremiah didn't write Jeremiah, bee sting. If someone says, um, Paul didn't write Ephesians, that's more of a beehive. That's what we're trying to identify here, okay? So this is what we're trying to answer. I don't know if I should care. Well, here's how we're going to do it. So the first question that this whole lead up for the past 30 minutes has gotten into is answering this first question. What are we assuming about the book's origin? Okay, now I'm actually returning back to the structure of the handout. So question one, what are we assuming about the book's origin? Because modern conceptions of authorship do not necessarily map on to ancient conceptions. Okay? Second, what does the book actually claim about its own origins? Right? Because all that information that we have about Jeremiah comes from Jeremiah's claim about Jeremiah. So what does it actually claim about uh, its origin? And thirdly, what do the data that the critic is discussing what do those data actually prove? Okay. Do they prove forgery or do they just disprove inscription? Because those are not necessarily the same. Okay? So these are the three questions. 
So first, what do we assume about the book's origin? This is what I just went through the whole time. This is asking this question. You think that person wrote the book of person, but he didn't. Well, the question is, how do you fill in this question mark? Make sure you write that down and think about that. Because if that's what's being objected to, maybe the, what you put in this question mark isn't what the scroll claims about itself. Right? So that's the first question. And we already did all that. That was the whole point of uh, the book of Jeremiah. So the second question is, what does the book actually claim about its origins? And this is important because if you were here at the beginning of the semester, uh, Dr. Green talked about this word inerrancy. Does anyone remember that? Is anyone here for that? What does inerrancy mean? Does anybody remember? Very good. A plus for Katie, yes. It means without error. Um, so yes, inerrancy is what a bunch of guys in the 70s uh, got together to define um, as what, the, what it means to say that the Bible is authoritative, that it is without error. Okay? There's a huge debate about this. There are people on all sides of the, the, the aisle about this. But in the context here in America, in, uh, America, especially here in the South, most churches, most evangelical churches, are going to subscribe to some version of inerrancy which means that whatever the Bible says is true, more or less, and it doesn't make mistakes. And what's important is that the technical definition of inerrancy, it does not, oh, sorry, it does only apply to what the text claims about itself, okay? It only applies to the text claims about itself. Here's the exact quote. This is R.C. Sproul and some other people that wrote this statement. We deny the legitimacy of any treatment of the text that leads to rejecting its claims to authorship. Its claims. So what is going to happen, preview of coming events, is sometimes you think that person wrote Bible book because church tradition teaches that person wrote Bible book. Right? Or it is a scholarly hypothesis that person wrote. Bible book. But if you are interested in inerrancy, this only this doesn't apply to church tradition or Jewish tradition or scholarly hypotheses. It only applies to the text claims about itself. So if you dispute an authorship claim that does not come from the text itself, you're not disputing inerrancy. You're disputing something else. Okay? So that's why the question, what does the text claim about its own origins, is so important. Because sometimes people conflate this and think that um, challenging an authorship thing is challenging biblical authority, and it's not. Okay? So now, the question is, what does the Bible say about its authorship? And this is where I did a little bit of my own sort of independent research. Uh, this may have errors because uh, it is not peer-reviewed or anything, but this is what, how I would answer that question based off of what I've been able to find. Okay, And that is that 21 books of the Bible are formally anonymous. Formally anonymous. This is on the back of your, your handout. Um, and I have a definition. So formally anonymous, that just means that the book itself never actually says, this is the man what wrote it. And that no other book in the Bible says, this is the man what wrote it. Okay? Here are those books for you to look at. I know you have a handout, but uh, pretend you didn't look at it. What percentage of the Bible do you think this accounts for? That is a very good guess. <laughs> yes. Word count. By word count. Yes. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. Good question. We'll get to that in a second. Right now I'm doing the, the percentage bit. We've got to do this bit first, and then we'll get to that. So, yes, 44% of the Bible does not make a claim to authorship. Is that surprising? Well, it's not surprising because you looked out in your handout. But prior, prior to, like, 45 minutes ago, would you have been surprised to learn this? So these 14 make no internal claims to their authorship, and, they, and no other book gives any hints about their authorship. Um, they're not listed on the handout. You can download these slides. If you want to fact check me, please do. Uh, it's at the TechSag link, or it will be after, after tonight. I'll upload it. 
So you can download it and fact check me. And I also have the spreadsheet of all the data analysis if you want to look into that. So these 14 have no claims. These seven have hints about the author, like the type of person, but not anything about a name, right? So, for example, first, third, uh, first, and th uh, yeah. first John says, that which we have seen with our own eyes. So he's claiming to be an eyewitness of the ministry of Jesus. But nowhere in any of the Johns does he say, I am John. Okay. Or um, the book or the gospel of John. This is the beloved disciple who writes these things. But nowhere in the gospel does it identify who the beloved disciple is. Yes, sir. That's a good question. Should should we? I mean, I feel like there's there's decent arguments for both sides. Like on one side you've got the anonymity of it. Mm -hmm. If it were not about names, then you've got the relatedness of it. And I think that we sort of go broad with that. And it's like mm -hmm. the author kind of wrote this story and so you kind of think be about what I know. Yeah. 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 This is a good question. So, uh, the I want to make a distinction between what a book claims and what is known about a book, okay. right? So, I think that there's very good evidence that John, Mark, Luke, and Matthew, like I think those guys actually are the correct identification. But the purpose here is just to recognize if someone disputes that John Mark wrote Mark, they're not arguing with the authority of the Bible. They're arguing the historical evidence of church tradition and all of those things. Yeah, that's, that's a very, so that's the key point. Now, um, it is important in other debates because sometimes you have questions where was this written by a disciple does matter and was it written by this specific disciple? Like when you start debating why were these books canonized, then those questions start getting uh, important. But, but the key point right here is just to recognize what the Bible claims about itself and to make that distinction that John Mark is not something that the Gospel of Mark claims. It is something that church tradition has ascribed. I think that is a correct description, but it's not a biblical one. Yes. Right. Okay. So that would be those that are formally anonymous. The next category are books that have of claims. So, for example, the Psalms have a lot of Psalms of David or of uh, Asaph or the Proverbs of Solomon, of Agur, of the son of David, or the song of Solomon. So what does this mean? So the of um, claim here is actually enormously flexible. It can mean everything from, this is the guy that wrote it, and now I am, I'm titling it so you know that this is who it's from, and he wrote it, all the way down to, this is in the wisdom tradition of Solomon, for example. So when it says the Proverbs of Solomon, it is linguistically permissible to say it is claiming everything from Solomon was the man that actually wrote this down, all the way down to this was in the wisdom tradition and philosophy of Solomon. Again, like I said, this isn't about what Solomon did and didn't write, it's what are the claims. And this of term um, is surprisingly flexible. And that's uh, another 6% of the Bible. The next 15%, sorry, yes? Is this my own research in the corner? Yes. Very good question. These slides are formally anonymous. I didn't put my name in there. <laughs> yes, good question. The next category uh, of books, these reference assistants in the composition uh, process. So these can be scribes, or the fancy term that I have in your definitions is amanuensis, or amanuensis. That's a fancy word. It just means a guy that writes it down or the guy that's with a scribe. So we already talked about our friend Jeremiah and his friend Baruch. Well, several of the letters of Paul... Um, these three specifically identify, or sorry, these two specifically identify Tertius and Sosthenes, sorry. Uh, these were literary assistants. In Galatians, it doesn't identify it, but Paul makes this aside where he says, look how I'm writing at you with my own hand now, implying that everything prior to that was somebody else writing, right? So that's where that comes from. Sylvanus in 1 Peter. 
Proverbs has, in the last section, it says these were the Proverbs that were assembled by the men of Hezekiah. So going back to my earlier comment that the wisdom tradition of Solomon was kind of preserved through the Judean courts, there were men that were compiling them together, putting them together. The men of Hezekiah are one group of them. Okay. And then there's also a small sliver. Paul references his uh, co-authors in these letters. So he, he'll say, Paul and Timothy greet you in the Lord. And it's mostly Paul and Tim. He's, Paul and Timothy are in all of them. He does one with Silas, a oh, typo, it's supposed to be Silas. So he does these three just with Timothy, these with Silas and Timothy. But it is unclear how much of that was Paul writing, how much of that was Timothy writing, how much was a collaboration. It's not specified. And if you just assume, oh, well, Timothy just got his name added on at the end, like, uh, you know, like the, the undergraduate who joined the project at the last minute, to go back to Caleb's example, yeah, that's an assumption. Okay. The next 15%, these, they give a name. They give a specific name, a specific person. They give kind of who's associated with it. But they don't say much about the composition after that. For example, the book of Jonah. Fun story about Jonah and everything. Um, the fish, the men of Nineveh, all that. No commentary on where this thing came from. No commentary on how it was written. You don't have. And then Jonah sat down and wrote the book of Jonah, which you are reading right now, right? Um, and this is all the minor prophets that are associated with that. I forgot this. Uh, over here on this side, these are the authorship models that I think are consistent with the textual claims. I think that might have been implicit, but that's what's going on there. Okay. Okay. The next 16%, these are books that they claim partial inscription, meaning it says this event happened and Moses wrote it down, or Moses wrote down the law of God, or this event happened and Joshua wrote it down. In fact, those are the only two examples, right? But it doesn't claim Moses wrote everything that you're reading in your hand right now, or Joshua wrote every single thing that you're reading in your hand right now. It just says Moses wrote this section or this section, okay? Which then leaves us with this final category, about 5% of the Bible, that actually claims, here's the one guy who wrote this. And they are all in the New Testament. <coughs> Mostly letters of Paul, and then a couple of others. Yes, sir? I was kind of surprised when they're putting Luke's in First and Second Peter. Oh, yes, yeah, Second Peter. It seems like some of the scholars who understood the Greek language wrote First Peter, and the second yep. book seems to be written by a fisherman. Yep. The second book claims to be solely written by yep. Exactly. There you go. That's, that's part of the issue, right? Okay, so this was a fun little tour. I appreciate you uh, um, indulging, me, indulging me on that. But you may be thinking, what, what's the point of this other than you were procrastinating at work and wanted to look up the Bible books, right? Bible book trivia. Well, the whole point is that what the book actually claims about itself is that's what gets the preeminence in these debates. So whenever someone says, for example, and these are, these are the books that are the most contested, I think, yeah, so you'll see 2 Corinthians, well, I don't know about 2 Corinthians, but Ephesians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, uh, and Titus, these three are some of the most hotly debated uh, letters of Paul. Ephesians less so, but these two especially. So when someone comes along and says, Paul did not write this, and you see, well, it claims that Paul wrote it, he's the sole author, and it kind of seems like we're only limited to these four options, then if the data rule out all four of those options, that's going to be a serious issue. Does that make sense? Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Is anyone curious of uh, any Bible trivia on the books that I showed up here? Yes, Katie? Uh, mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. That yes. Yeah. So this is a good question. So the um, the the answer is that Paul and and actually nobody really nobody is under any obligation to disclose who dictated or did the writing. So if Paul used an amanuensis, he doesn't have to disclose that any more than when you type an essay, you have to disclose whether you typed it on a Dvorak keyboard or a QWERTY keyboard, right? 
doesn't, you don't have to disclose that. Um, and so in these cases, the reason it's left open is because since Paul doesn't actually have to specify that, he, there, there's nothing that uh, specifically rules that out. And even in the case of Galatians, the only reason that I included it in that previous category is because he took an aside and said, I am now writing with my own hand. If he hadn't done that, Galatians would be in this category. So you don't have an obligation. You're not obligated to do that. And so my pet theory is that he used an amanuensis for First and Second Timothy because First and Second Timothy have certain Greek words that only show up in Luke. So my pet theory is that Luke, the traveling companion of Paul, wrote all four of those. That's my pet theory, personally. But that's consist- it's consistent with the data and consistent with the claims of Scripture. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. That they, they just all knew mm-hmm. what yeah. So all of the pretty much, especially with the New Testament. So th- this is where like the New Testament and the Old Testament questions start to really get important because they're radically different composition, canonical processes, and whatnot. In the case of the New Testament, almost all of the New Testament books, with the exception of three of the Gospels, are letters addressed to somebody. So the person that received it knew who it was received from. And as long as that person knew, and especially with the churches, right? Like, to the church at Thessalonica, okay, well, the church of Thessalonica knows who sent the letter, right? Um, Because it was delivered to them, and they knew who it was, who it was reading to them and all that. So in that case, when you start getting the evidence, you have these churches that they preserve these letters and then have that tradition um, that they preserve. And then later, when this is all assembled together into a, a New Testament, the but labels they found also there. Given the four gospels early on. I mean, yeah. When, um, they were traveling around and, and sure. they were being read in the. Yeah, 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 they were. They would, they would, they would not know that. Too. Yeah, I, I'm just saying in the, the, in the case of the, the, the letters or the epistles, those are sent to someone from someone. So it's, it's a very clear case of like, yeah, we know where this came from because it was sent to us. Um, and then the same thing with Theophilus with Luke and Acts. That was sent to him, so he knew where it came from. Okay, good question. All right, so now we come to the final question to ask. So we've questioned our assumptions, and we've questioned what the text actually claims. And now the question is, what do the data actually prove? Okay. Um, I have two examples, but I will be scant with the first one, and we'll talk about the second one. Okay, so Bart the Critic. Okay. This is, our, this is our guy, Bart the Critic. So one argument um, for thinking that Paul didn't write Ephesians is that a lot of the stuff that, a lot of the vocabulary that Paul uses is different than the vocabulary in his other books, right? So when we compare Romans and we compare Ephesians, we can see some of the terminology doesn't quite line up. And so Bart's argument is the vocabulary is different, therefore it's a forgery. I want to be kind. He has like seven arguments. This is just one of them. So it's not like here's the one thing. Okay. Okay. But the question is, okay, this is a data point. All right, Paul's vocabulary seems to be different in these two letters. So here we go. This is Paul, the letter to the Ephesians. What are we assuming about its authorship? Well, Bart's going to say it was forged. The relationship between Paul and this, a sneaky person trying to impersonate Paul. Okay. That's what he's going to say. And the response is, okay, well, let's think about this. Does a variance in vocabulary actually rule out authorship, right? Which of these would be compatible with a variance in vocabulary? Well, clearly a forgery is compatible with that. But pretty much all these other ones are compatible with that too. In fact, we don't even have to leave the inscription category to consider why someone's vocabulary would be different when talking to one church in Rome and another church in Ephesus, right? different contexts, different heresies, different uh, questions asked, different amanuensises that are used, right? Remember, Tertius is writing Romans, whereas Ephesians, uh, there's no, we don't know who, if anybody, or if Paul wrote it himself, right? Now, if you're interested in that, our friend Ben, who's not here, did a whole lecture on this. You can go deep into the weeds. That's about First and Second Timothy and Titus, uh, looking at multiple arguments on that. 
So I will just be brief and we'll move on uh, from there. Okay? But yes, yes, sir. Uh, can we consider like geographic content? Mm -hmm. like, like oh, yes. Yeah, absolutely. There are, like I said, in, in this case, for the limited case of why vocabulary might differ, we don't even have to go to these other categories. We can stay here and just say, well, Paul is a different age, so maybe he's changed his vocabulary. Paul's reflected on things, so he expresses things differently. He's speaking to a different audience. The, the vocabulary that I use with my research group, with you guys, with my wife, and with my children is not the same category, right? So it's different vocabulary. So we don't even have to get out of, out of this to start seeing the weakness. And to be fair to Bart, the vocabulary argument is the weakest of the arguments. The stronger arguments are going to be things like um, theological differences. It seems like Paul's theology is different. Yeah. Okay. But I don't, like I said, Ben gets into that in there. We can talk about that afterwards. Um, when the clock hits 9.30, we're going to dip and go around the corner to the Chick-fil-A. We can talk about that more if you'd like. But yeah, that's that. Okay. So that's hitting from the left, if you will, quote unquote, from the left. That's a critical argument. I'm actually going to now critique a conservative argument or a fundamentalist argument, okay? This is where I want to spend more time because I, I think that this is, this is more fun and spicy. Okay, so this is our friend Steve the Fundamentalist from Arizona. And uh, he's concerned about the authorship of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, okay? And he says, look, Jesus says in John chapter 5, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for Moses wrote of me. Therefore, Moses wrote every single word in the Pentateuch, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Okay? And so Carol has the same degree of skepticism she does for Bart. She's like, hmm, that seems a bit hasty, right? But his argument kind of makes sense, right? Jesus is God. Jesus can't be wrong. Jesus says something, it's true. Jesus says, Moses wrote of me, therefore it's true, okay? So here's Moses. This is the law of Moses, the books of Moses. So now the question is, how is this put together? Okay. And he is going to say, well, I'll tell you what happened. Moses sat down and wrote all five of these books together. Okay. But now the question is, does this really, can we really extrapolate to that level and say that Moses wrote everything? Because in, uh, in the Pentateuch, we have an entire first book called the book of Genesis. And the book of Genesis does not have Moses in it. Everything in the book of Genesis happens before Moses is even born, because he shows up in Exodus. And even in Exodus, a good half of Exodus is before Moses is born, right? So we can see in that case that at least with the book, of, if you're going to try and make an argument, oh, here's what happened. The reason we know that Moses wrote the book of Genesis is because Jesus said, Moses wrote of me, even though he doesn't specify what book he's talking about. He just says, Moses wrote of me. Then you're going to have to extrapolate that Moses wrote everything in Genesis, even though there are things in Genesis that show pretty clear, not original to Moses things. For example, there are lists of names and genealogies in the book of Genesis. And they start off, this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. This is the book of the genealogy of Noah. This is the book, et cetera, et cetera. And it reads very clearly like this is not something Moses would write down because where would he get his information? Somewhere else. So that's kind of where that argument goes. So if you think about it like that, we can see that, at least in the case of Genesis, that Moses is over here in the compilation area, right? Even if he wrote the majority of the Pentateuch or, or a good chunk of it, at least his material for Genesis is going to be compiling earlier evidence together as opposed to him writing it afresh and brand new. Make sense? That's kind of the, the flavor of the argument. And as you can imagine, there's a lot more there. I had a whole video about this that's an hour long, talks about mosaic authorship, gets deep into the weeds uh, over there, okay? So, in summary, our question was, you think person wrote Bible book, but he didn't. And the questions that we're going to ask to interrogate whether that's a serious objection or not are first, what are we assuming about the text? Second, what does the text actually claim about its origins? And thirdly, what do the data actually prove? Because if you rule out one model, you don't necessarily rule out the others. Okay? Well, I appreciate it. We have about five minutes for questions and comment. Yes, David. 
I don't need the applause. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. where the dominant method of interpretation in the evangelical world is about determining the intent of the author mm -hmm. the of the text. Yes. So if we change what it means to be an author, it seems to be sort of uh, you know, comprehensive mm -hmm. thought. How does that change mm. how we interpret the Bible? Yeah, this is a good question, and I can give you a perfect example for this, okay? Who here would say your favorite book of the Bible is 1 Kings? How many of you have read 1 Kings in the past? Huh? When I was seven. When you were seven. Okay, how many of you read through 1 Kings and did not fall asleep? <laughs> A couple, okay. So 1 Kings and 2 Kings. Now, how many of you have read 1 and 2 Chronicles? Okay, good. Why do we have four books that tell the same story? What's the point of that, right? They tell the entire history of Israel, although Chronicles takes it, includes some stuff from Genesis, right? So what we know, first of all, is that the authors of Kings and Chronicles are different people, and we know that they are not writing original material because they're saying, here's our history. So they've got to be doing some kind of background research and compilation. And they even include, is this not written in the book of Jasher? Is this not written in the records of uh, Solomon? Is this not written in the records of Ahab, etc.? So then the question is for authorial intent. Why do we have First and Second Kings, and why do we have First and Second Chronicles? Why did they assemble the stories they did? Why did they leave out the stuff they did? Why did they include the stuff that they did? And the standard answer, the standard interpretive answer, is that First and Second Kings is written to tell, to answer the question, why did we go into exile? Because the Jews went into exile, the Northern Kingdom and, and the Jews they went into exile, right? That's how Kings ends. And so the, the thesis, the authorial intent of the Book of Kings, is what most people think it is at least, is to answer the question, why did we go into exile? First and Second Chronicles answers a different question, which is, why should we go back to the land of Israel? And so when you read First and Second Kings, you're like, man, these guys are awful. These are some like really, really bad kings. Why on earth would God have any dealings with these people? But if you read Chronicles, you will not find Bathsheba and David in Chronicles not mentioned. Solomon just shows up. <laughs> I don't know who his mom is. Uh, there's an incident, a uh, little incident where uh, David accidentally causes a plague. Well, in Kings, it's David's fault. In Chronicles, Satan's involved somehow. So David's kind of distant, distanced from that in, in that interpretation. You will find, this is my favorite one, this is fun. There's no exodus and conquest in Chronicles. In fact, there are stories in Chronicles which only make sense if the uh, inhabitants of the land were indigenous. So there's like a story, I think it's in First Chronicles 8, where there are some, uh, not cattle wrestlers, like sheep wrestlers or something. And this, there's this whole fun little story. But then when you look with the genealogy, you're like, wait, this is before Joshua, but it's after Joseph. And it's in the land of Israel. Like it gives geographical markers. Why are there sons of Abraham running around in this land period when they're supposed to be in Egypt? And then Joshua, the son of Nun, just shows up in the Chronicles genealogy. Where did he come from? Oh, I'm just here. I've been here the whole time. What are you talking about? And so when you think about it in that sense, then you can start to say, oh, the way that the author of Kings is assembling this history is to answer this question. Here's all the horrible sins that you did. Here's how you defiled the land. This is why God's judgment is on you. But the answer to Chronicles is to a generation that's coming back and saying, why did we even deserve, why, why are we even here in the first place? What is the kingdom that we're supposed to build? And it says, well, here's the ideal kingdom. This is what David was supposed to be. This is how David lived it out, what it was supposed to be. Um, and so that's why, that's why they're there. And, and that's what their authorial intent is. That was a bit longer of an example than I intended, but I hope that helps. Yes? Of, of what? Um, Ezra and Nehemiah. So I, I confess, my knowledge of the prophets is like really thin compared to, the, compared to the narrative. But Ezra and Nehemiah, those are stories about Ezra and about Nehemiah rebuilding the temple, and it's about their return and about the prophecies that they're giving and things like that. But Chronicles and Kings is like, this is the whole narrative of, you know, Kings, or, sorry, Chronicles, and actually, when I say Kings, I, sorry, Kings actually starts in like 1 Samuel, like 1 Samuel 
Second Samuel, First Samuel. That's all one chunk. So it, talk, it starts all the way back with David and Samuel and Saul and that business. It goes all the way up in through the exile. Yeah. Okay. We have time for one more. One more comment or question. What about it? What? <laughs> Hebrews. Yeah, Hebrews. Hebrews is in the Bible. So yeah, this was actually a fun conversation. I'll I will credit I will credit Caleb um, for for this. We were having an interesting conversation about Hebrews in uh, at our, at the leader meeting. And what's interesting about these authorships? I'll steal your example v- verbatim. Um, he's the author of this example, if you will. Joel, the prophet Joel. What do we know about him? Nothing. We know his name, though. That's cool. His dad's name is Bethuel. There you go. Fun fact. That's all we know about him. Author of Hebrews. What do we know about him? Well, he heard the gospel. He's a Christian. He's second generation. He knows some of the apostles. He probably talked with Jesus. I don't remember. May or may not have been involved. A lot of stuff that we know about him. Do we know his name? Nope. Doesn't claim it. Historically, it was associated with Paul, um, but even as early as Jerome, like in the uh, third century, they're like, I I don't think Paul wrote this. I think this was just added on to Paul's letters. And there are multiple different suggestions on who it could be. Maybe it's Apollo, uh, uh, not Apollo, um, what am I trying to say? Maybe it's Bartholomew or one of other, Paul's other associates. Maybe it's Timothy, who knows? Don't really know. Yes. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the yeah the New Testament is ordered like like you said it's ordered by author by and by length usually for the epistles. So that's why Romans is first because it's the longest, and why uh, um, Philemon and Titus and those guys are at the end. But Hebrews is longer than all of them and it's put at the end. So yeah, in the can, not in the canonizing process, which was done like the formal. Lists and whatnot were second century, third century on there, like the Muratorian fragments, an example. Um, it, it always kind of added that on as an appendix to the Pauline letters. But not, so. Okay, we actually went over time. I didn't mean to do that. So, yeah. Okay. All right, I appreciate it. Thank, I didn't mean to go over time. We're going to go around the corner to the Chick fil A and we'll continue talking about this, or we can continue last week's conversation. <laughs>